My name is Richard Anton. I'm a principal engineer. I work at Amazon Advertising. I've uh, been writing software since the 90s <laughs> at this point. Um, about eight years of that time, I've been at Amazon across two stints. Uh, I was also at AWS, besides Amazon Advertising, for about a year in open source observability there. Um, and I was also at Google SRE for five plus years. Uh, before my big, big company days, um, I worked at a variety of small companies no one's ever heard of. Um, I was also in the Army Signal Corps for four years long ago. Um, so where I work now um, is called Devices, Audio, Video, and Digital Advertising, which is part of Amazon Ads. Um, so we're a little bit of kind of like the, the new ad products org. So we do a lot of integrations um, for different um, advertising systems, like across content providers, publishers. So Fire TV, Twitch, Freebie. We do audio and video ads, display ads. Um, so it's a really diverse group to work in. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of collaboration and communication challenges and when teams try to fix those with technical solutions, because uh, I've seen this, this pattern in different places. Um, so at Amazon, we try to organize teams so that they can be as separate and autonomous as possible so they can work efficiently, right, to lower the communication overhead. But they depend on different kind of ad tech infrastructure teams and other kinds of infrastructure teams as well. So there's kind of a lot of cross team dependencies for things like, you know, ad pasting, audience management, ad bidding and serving. Uh, just there's like many more examples. So, you know, there's only so autonomous you can make a team, right? So, you know, just imagine for a moment, you find yourself at a big tech company, not necessarily a tech company, but a large company with a big software development department, at least. And so they're, they're teams that build infrastructure and they're teams that build kind of customer facing products or things higher up the stack. And as the business grows, you, you tend to get some challenges across team collaboration, which is a good problem to have because it means you're succeeding, but it, it's still a problem so that you could keep succeeding. Um, and, you know, there's like widely discussed kind of like basic reasons for this, right? Like communications in squared by default it was called Metcalf's law, although that was in the context of networking rather than people. Um, and then Conway's law, which is usually described as shipping the org chart. Technically, it's shipping your communication structure. Um, so this is really where the, the challenges come in. Uh, the other thing is you get kind of a lot of coordination needed for roadmaps and for prioritization. And just generally, enterprise architecture, when you get a lot of teams involved, is pretty complicated. Um, another thing that brings in cross-team like communication and collaboration needs is kind of like team mitosis. So teams grow, build new things, they build new components, they ship new features. Naturally, they split up to kind of be an effective sized team again, if for no other reason than a people manager is eventually overloaded. And so you end up with systems that were concentrated in a single team that didn't have a lot of cross-team communication. Now they have components spread across two teams and they kind of automatically get this coordination overhead, even if they explicitly built to avoid it. And then the further you are kind of down the stack of services and dependencies, you tend to get a larger number of outside asks for support, for feature requests, bug fixes, design consultations. Um, and so this takes up bandwidth. Um, and it causes randomization and randomization tends to frustrate people, right? So engineers like building things, you know, sometimes we get a little um, cloistered and avoid reaching out to talk to people versus working on some code. And all of this kind of support requests plus these cross team dependencies that it leads to resource contention. And so the the intuition for how to deal with the resource tuition or with the resource contention rather can be a bit problematic because it's counterintuitive. So teams that intake mechanisms, so this, this is how a triage bug request, this is how we prioritize feature requests, this is how we assign people to help with design consultations. Um, unfortunately, this actually increases the amount of coordination needed across teams. So you get backlog coupling, which is okay until you hit the priority inversion part. 
So basically you can end up with team A needs something from team B, needs something from team C, needs something from team A. Your, your graph starts having cycles in it. Um, you can resolve these situations with escalation, but escalation is expensive. It usually isn't taken as an option until things are relatively far along. And sometimes, especially if it's not done well, it can cause hard feelings across teams. And so the first family of things to address this that I've, I've, you know, seen in practice is at least sometimes is people, you know, they're builders or engineers, they look for technical solutions to their problems. So the kind of meta pattern here is they try to make the system more self-service. They try to make it so their clients and their customers don't need changes from them to build their feature, to change their data schema, to change their configuration, to deploy their custom code. And so this, this, I mean, it, it really does help, but it's usually major changes. Sometimes it's a complete rewrite. Um, production systems means production users, production traffic. So that means an enterprise migration. These take a long time, even when well done, because you have to be careful that you're not breaking things along the way. And so, you know, these teams are building things to make people more autonomous, to try and reduce the communication burden and basically make it big O of less than N squared. Um, we tend to call this federation and in the most like advanced version of this, it's letting your customers actually basically deploy code themselves that runs in your service. So it's like very customizable, basically like plugins, but it's, it's easy when doing a rewrite to make things more self-service and address your problems to get tangled up in the second system effect, which is, as Fred Brooks put it, the mythical man month, the tendency to basically include all the ideas, frills that were purposely de-scoped the first time. So that's basically, you know, the thesis of this talk is these technical solutions, they're often necessary, but they're also not really sufficient. Those teams that want to build the more self-service version, the more automated version and make things more, you know, decoupled and autonomous, they, they have to keep the lights on for V1 while they're building V2. It's typically the same people doing that. Uh, the requests keep coming in because the self-service capabilities aren't shipped yet. So the team building the solution has now split their bandwidth and they were already basically the bottleneck. And also this tends to get caught up in the planning fallacy, which is the, you know, the psychological effect that human beings, including those of us that know about the planning fallacy, have an unconscious bias towards underestimates and optimism when planning things. Um, this also relates to how code is owned. Um, ownership is a leadership principle at Amazon. Uh, that's really meant when it's working well to apply to customer problems. So you want people to be strong owners of the outcome so they don't say, this isn't my job, right? And you don't get the um, kind of like diffuse ownership where no one will tackle the problem. But when you start applying too strong of an ownership model directly to specific code modules, it can have some adverse side effects. Um, and this list is Martin Fowler's version of like describing different kinds of ownership between, you know, siloed completely weak where specific responsibility and collective where there's really no, no fences at all. Um, I haven't seen many organizations make it completely to collective. I've seen them try. Um, but if you're too high up this chart is when you start to see these side effects. Um, and so these, these concerns between I'm going to rewrite things so they're more flexible for my customers but I have to triage all my customer requests. So, you know, I'm splitting work between the old version, the new version, the customer requests. Uh, this understandably puts teams a bit on the defensive with how they prioritize things and triage the work. So they make intake processes if they didn't have them. Sometimes they make them more strict if they did have them. These processes actually take bandwidth to run. So then it's one more uh, time consuming task and the balancing act. And they also sometimes when this is, um, you know, more, more of a problem, it leads to less bandwidth for addressing technical debt in general, like CICD and test infrastructure, uh, which is particularly problematic because there are a lot of studies that show that deployment frequency um, is really one of the, and lower batch size along with it, it's one of the main indicators of effective organizations. And so you, you don't want to see that go down. And the other part of this like fortress mentality is if the testing infrastructure isn't there or when the outside people that want to contribute don't have the expertise, 
they don't have the bandwidth from the team to help them, then they really, they get kind of nervous taking the outside changes because they're afraid they break something. Um, and those people that are blocked on them and want to make those changes, they, they offer to make them themselves, right? People try to solve their own problems. But the host team by this point, when this situation happens, is short on bandwidth to support them with reviews and onboarding and documentation improvements and design consultations and troubleshooting when things don't go perfectly. And so basically this is, you know, all of this so far is basically the problem statement, the technical solutions, the problems with only the technical solutions. Um, and this is where InnerSource comes into it. And basically why, much like the last talk, Natalie's, like the culture is important, uh, the unofficial practices are important. So when you already have the technical parts there, like you know, code sharing, transparent view of backlogs, all those kinds of things, there, there's still things you need to do to work effectively across a big org. Um, so InterSource provides a scalable strategy for this. So the fundamental problem is really when the amount of changes and support for a system increases disproportionately to the number of staff who have the expertise, the ability and the permissions, and the willingness to make those changes. So you have to like basically let the help in. Um, and another way it helps is to provide learning opportunities so that more people have a chance to build expertise on the systems. You reduce the buzz factor, the, the, the genuine bottleneck, not the, you know, any artificial one with process, but the one that's genuinely bottleneck in terms of the number of people with expertise gets better as well. And so really the way you have to do this is to prioritize the work that enables the outside help to actually arrive. And it's not necessarily technical. So this is, again, it's about onboarding, mentoring, doing reviews for code and design, documentation improvements. Basically, like you have to open the gate or the cavalry isn't coming. It's kind of how I see this. And so, you know, then it's like, how do you get this started? Get people more willing to make these outside contributions. Um, and so one way see to do this is to make it lower risk. Um, so take contributions that, you know, it's not easy for them to break the system if they're not an expert yet, or you don't have a lot of time to assist system, but improve the situation for themselves and others. So documentation improvements, test coverage improvements, deployment automation improvements, helping other people on board. And then you can kind of build up the muscles on the host team and the outside team for making these cross team contributions more and they get more comfortable with them they spread a little more expertise and then you can start taking new features and functionality you can start working with them bigger design changes and i think most importantly is you can give them a path to have more more permissions and approval and stuff and actually become a trusted committer so these are the specific tactics that you know, I'm currently focused on, and I think it will help other people in similar situations. One is to set clear criteria for what's what's needed from the host team to take advantage of this to make things better. And so a lot of these are practices documented in a source commons, but these are the ones I think most pertinent to the, the situation where you have the technical underpinnings, but you need the actual communication to go more smoothly. So you need a seed product, you need the base documentation, the host team needs to commit at least one trusted committer, someone who's going to actually take mentorship, help, onboarding requests, those kinds of things with a major portion of their time without having to pre-negotiate the priorities across teams roadmaps most critically. Um, another reason, or excuse me, another tactic is the 30 day warranty. So to lower the risk of the team accepting the outside contributions, basically have an agreement that the contributing team is going to own problems that arise due to it for you know, 30 days or some other value. The other thing is maybe the most important, but it's to reward and recognize people for contributions and for being trusted committers and on both sides of the equation, and also to make sure that perception and reality match up to educate the leaders and managers in the organization so that they see this as valuable and they understand the impact because that's really important in, in an organization where you have uh, people managers that are managing software engineering teams. You know, people know that that's who writes basically their performance review usually, 
and other things that matter to their career. They want to make sure that their manager sees that it's valuable. So it's also important to educate those folks as well. Um, and besides the the you know education, the rewards, the recognition is really important. So internal badging things, um, both for contributors, for committers, for projects, um, and also just saying thanks, right, in the simplest kind of way. So this is the we, beginning we of the journey. On the on the clock a little bit. Yep, last slide actually. <laughs> Um, so this is the beginning of the journey. So some of the things to ensure success um, in this situation is we're framing it as an experiment. It's easier to get people to buy in if you kind of give them, we're going to try this for X amount of times, and here's the engagement pattern. We're investing in measuring success with metrics like cross-team contributions, number of projects onboarded, qualitative surveys with developers' experience, especially around being blocked on other teams. Um, and we're also making sure to set realistic expectations that while we're getting things set up, uh, we're likely to go slower so we can go faster later. Uh, there's a military expression that slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So there we are. And I, the, the parting thing I would give to, to others in a similar situation is just, you know, have a plan, but get started. Culture change is a, a, a long process and it does require patience, but you have to start somewhere. That's it. Thanks for the talk. And I'll be around for questions at the end.